Well, I thank God today that Bobby Scott has come our way. He is the pastor of discipleship at Community of Faith Bible Church in Southgate, California. He has degrees from UCLA, Master's Seminary, including a THM from there. Uh, he's an author, and you can follow his podcast at Truth in the City. I don't know how he has time to do that because he's also married to Naomi and has six children. Would you welcome Bobby Scott to Gateway this morning? Well, first of all, let me uh, bring greetings from Community of Faith Bible Church. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to be here. I want to thank the faculty for the generous invitation to come. And I understand it is finals week, so I want to especially commend you all for coming out when you could be studying, <laughs> bumping that B plus to an A minus. So thank you for coming. Hopefully there'll be something encouraging from the word today that will motivate you and inspire you to, uh, to do well in your finals. But I certainly will have you on my heart as I, as I pray. Now, with the opportunity that I have to preach with you all today, I, I was thinking about what it is the Lord would have you all to do when you leave this place, that you're getting trained and you're getting equipped uh, to walk into a world to be salt and light. And we need those who will go into our world that are armed with the truth of the word of God. So it's a challenging assignment that our king has called us to. I got a call on Thanksgiving that one of our members was out of town, but she got a call from her family that her son here, 40 years old, completely healthy, had a heart attack and he died. And just a year or so before that, his wife had died in a motorcycle accident. So her grandsons in their early 20s now don't have a father or a mother. And I have to do the funeral on Saturday. And a few months before that, we got a call from one of our church members that her brother had got shot and killed on the 91 freeway. And a month or two ago, it's actually maybe three weeks ago, I was in the hospital as their mother was on critical care, and they weren't sure if she was going to survive. And the question that I want to ask you is, what do you do with your training then? What do you say when you go to these grieving, broken families? What do we say when we go into our world where there's division everywhere when Jesus said a house divided won't stand? There's gender like wars going on in our nation. There are culture wars and ethnic wars and generation wars. We just have a divided nation. So, so we're getting trained, right, to go out and be like, but what do we say? What I want to encourage you to say is, is just tell them the story. <laughs> tell, them the, tell them the old, old story. Tell them the story of the Bible. Say it in love. Say it sensitively. Say it empathetically. Say it with tears sometimes. Say it compellingly, but tell them the story. And so what I want to do with the time I have today, I want, to, I want to go back and just tell us the story again. And I'm not going to have points. Uh, the Bible is a story, 66 books for sure, but it's also the scripture with a singular author, God, who's breathed out every word in your Bible. And when the Bible opens up and it tells us in the beginning, can I tell you that there's going to be a corresponding end? That the, the text is linked together from beginning to end, and it has, as all narratives do, a, a middle. And we can see that at the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I want to go back to the beginning of the story, because if you miss the beginning of the story, you won't be able to follow the storyline. You'll miss the conflict. You won't be able to discern the plot. So just to make sure we get the story, I want to go back to the very beginning of the story. I want to go back to Genesis chapter 1 and walk us through the first four chapters, but I know we've prayed, and I'm just going to invite us just to pray one more time. Will you bow with me as I ask God to help us? Lord, I thank you for these students, and I thank you for the commitment they are making before you to, to know your truth and to love your truth, to live your truth, and I pray like Ezra that they would teach it well, that they would teach it, Lord, in our context to people who need to hear your word. So bless God, even as they prepare and study, Lord, but I pray that you'd use even this time to encourage them, Lord, to, to love and to know your truth and to live it and to apply it. So bless the, the hearing of your word and help me, Lord, to be clear as I share it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. The Bible begins by saying, In the beginning God created the heavens 
and the earth. The most important truth in all the Bible is found right there in that very first verse. Not only in that verse, but it's repeated some 31 times in this creation narrative. This is God. This is God. The Bible begins by the most important being in all the universe, our God. That he made everything seen and unseen, and that's what verse 1 is telling us. But there is nothing in God's creation as, as a gift that's greater than the creator himself. That he stands over and above and sovereignly controlling everything that is. That here is not the, the, the natural laws of creation that's making creation. This is a miraculous event that God speaks and brings a universe out of nothing. And verse 2 tells us with a circumstantial clause that as God has created the earth, that it is formless and void. That it was in a state of being without shape. It was in a, a state of being empty. And the rest of Genesis chapter 1 shapes the shapeless and fills the void. The God separates the water, so you have the waters above, and now the waters on the earth, and he separates the waters from the land, and now it's shaped, and then he begins to fill it. He fills the, the land and the sea and the sky with, with, with incredible beings. He gives a life, and God does that miraculously. It, we can't look at a chicken and say, okay, we know where chickens come from. They come from eggs. There were no eggs in the beginning. God made everything, and then he created the means by which life would continue. And he sustains and providentially controls all of that, everything. But the Bible begins as stories do, and you meet the greatest, the most important, the most significant story in this, the character in this entire story. You meet God. And the text says in verse 26 and 27, we meet some other folks. It says of God in verse 26, God said, let us, and here you have this Elohim, this plural form of the word El, God, with a singular verb. There's something plural within the one God. We have one God, and there's a plurality within him, and the, the, the pronoun tells us that. Let us make. The God who is our one God has community within himself, and the rest of the story will, will explain that and, and tell us that God is a triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But here we have, as beginnings do, only an introduction. Only a teaser of our interest to, to keep reading about this one that nothing else in all of creation compares to. There's no one like him. There's nothing like him. And here it is this God who's made everything. He creates us. He said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And we all know, reading the Old Testament, what images are. They're, they're representatives of a deity. And here, God makes us not little gods, but he makes us like him so that we can represent him. That the God who created everything, he, he made us, and I'm going to translate it this way, that little and there, I'm a, I think it's a purpose clause in this context. He made us like him to represent him so that, so that we could rule over his creation. The sovereign one makes us like him. He, he communicates these attributes to us. We're rational beings. We're volitional beings. We're emotional beings. We're moral beings. We're relational beings. God gave us uh, attributes like him so that we could do something that he does. We could rule his creation. That, that over and above everything that God made in the creation, he made us uniquely like him to reflect the wonder of his glory and his being. That's important, saints. Uh, as, as, as we minister the gospel to people, as I'm, as I'm serving in my community, and as I'm seeing people go through all kinds of trials and struggles, I, they need to know who they are. Not what the culture says about them. Not simply what their eyes tell them about them. They need to know who they are. And there's massive deception in this world that we live in and confusion. So much so we don't even know who we are. The text says when God made us in verse 27, he created us. Male and female, he created them. That here God has made us and defined for us who we are so we don't have to guess or be confused. Aristotle was right when he just said that this, this real truth, that, that, that to say of what is, that it isn't, is false. And to say of what isn't, that it is, is false. But to say of what is that it is and what isn't that it isn't is true. And here, God who made everything, made reality. There are real things. The sun is real 
And, I, and, and we can know it's real because God made it and he told us what it is. And, and, there is, and there's a binary relationship that God made within the humanity. He made male and he made female. They're real things. They really are. There's maleness and there's femaleness because God made it and God defined it and God revealed it. It's there. there there's not an other category. And when God made us male and female, it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that man became a living soul. My, my maleness isn't simply attached biologically to my, to, to my sex, to my, 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 my sexual identity biologically and physiologically. My maleness is holistically what I am, both body and soul. That, that, that when in Abraham's bosom in the New Testament, when the rich man and Lazarus are there, Abraham is still Abraham and male. <laughs> the rich man is still male and, and burning in torment. And, and Lazarus is in the presence of the glory of God, and he is still male without a body yet. The resurrection will reattach that, but God made us male and female. And the text says, we both have been made male and female in his image and likeness, equal honor. Equal dignity, equal respect before God. We're humans. We've been made like God. And what a wonderful gift and what a powerful truth. So as much as I want to be six foot one, I'm simply not. <laughs> I was a decent athlete. And I told my mom, if you had made me just a little taller, mom, I'd have bought you a million dollar house. I'd be playing in the NFL, <laughs> but you made me too short. <laughs> And my identity is not based upon that feeling. I really am five, maybe seven, some days I'm five, seven. I really am, <laughs> close to that. And, and, and it's, but my feelings don't determine that. There's a God who made reality, and God has revealed that reality to us so that we can know. And Christians, we know. The only thing it takes for like, evil to flourish is for good people to, to do nothing. What it takes for lies to take root and dominate a culture is for those who are the pillar and support of the truth, as Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 15, to say and do nothing, to hide our truth under a bushel. Can I charge you with something? We need some brave Christians today yeah. to count the cost. You're learning truth to share truth. Right. And you've got to go out and just say, this is, there is a God. The fool says there is no God. There is a God, and he made the world we live in, and this is what he made us to be. And he made us in his image and likeness, and he made us so that we would rule. He made us so that we would rule, and the way you rule, according to verse 28, is a blessing. It says, be fruitful and multiply, and then it says this. It says, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the everything, fish of the sea and birds of the sky and on and on and on. And here when it says subdue it and rule over it, 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 a study of the word subdue in the Torah throughout the historical books is used consistently. It, it, it's, it's, it's spoken of when David subdues his enemies. It's spoken of when Solomon, all the enemies subdued, and so he, so he reigned in, 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 and he had and rest around the kingdom. It, it's spoken of, of Joshua when he fights the battles in the land that he has to subdue. And, and it simply means even if by force, you have to bring something into subjection. That's the idea of the word subdue. It's, it's used consistently in a militaristic context. And the fact that Adam here is called to rule, he's not talking about he's going to be a gardener. <laughs> he, Adam and Eve are king and queen of the, uni, of the, of the earth. But, but they have a task that, that, that all that is good is untested goodness. And it could turn very bad very fast if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so all that is good, they're charged now to keep it good. They have to subdue in order to keep it good. And, and as all stories begin, there's foreshadowing going on. If you want to know what he has to subdue, are you thinking about weeds or what? Just keep reading the story. and You'll find out very soon that in order to rule, he has to subdue. And if you don't rule, or if you don't subdue, rather, then you get ruled over. Whoever subdues rules. That's how it works. Whatever nation defeats the other nation, they rule, and they, and, and they bring the other one under sub subjugation. And so here, God made us in his image and likeness, male and female, and then he calls us, verse 31, to, to keep it all very good. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And this is not talking about in an aesthetic sense, and sure, it was, 
I can imagine how beautiful it all must have been. Uh, you know, I've gone to the Grand Canyon, and it's beautiful. I grew up on the East Coast, and one thing I miss is about, you know, the East Coast when I come out here, not the cold. I don't miss that at all. I don't, I don't know who, I, I, all this rain and stuff, you can leave that back east somewhere. But, but one thing I do miss is seeing the stars. I love seeing the stars. It's just amazing. But out here with all of our bright lights, we can't see the stars. And God made a beautiful creation. And sometimes you ask, why did he even make all those stars? Our most powerful telescopes can't even see them. Um, just because they to show his infinitude, that he is beyond all that is. And he makes this, 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 this universe that we can't measure because to show how his vastness. And, and he made it good, but not simply in an aesthetic sense. But this is teleological. This is, he made it, he calls it good because this is what I wanted. It is fulfilling his purpose, that he orders the universe. He, he's separating the waters from the land. He's, he, he's separating, the, he has male and female. He, he's structured, he's ordered it. He's like, okay, I, I made you male and female. I made you in my image and likeness. I want you to subdue and rule. Now keep it all very good. This is what I want. I want it like this. This is how I made it, and I want it to stay like this. Even with the echo of the charge, you may have to subdue to do that. You may have to subdue to keep it very well. So here, Adam and Eve are king and queen of the universe with this charge to subdue and rule creation. And they can because they've been made in God's image and likeness, but they can't without God's help. They're not little gods. Chapter 2 is clear that God, before he makes Eve, he gives Adam a command saying, verse 16, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. But he doesn't have a life inside of himself. Everything he has is dependent upon God. Apart from God, he can do nothing. The God made Adam king, but God is the great king. In Old Testament theology, God is the suzerain, and man is the vassal, and have a right relationship. Adam has to fully depend upon God in order to do what he's called him to do. And Eve hasn't been created yet, so the weight of these charges fall on Adam, that God would make him the head, and it would say that God would make Eve, in verse 18, to be a helper that corresponds and suitable to him. And it's not a helper of convenience that Adam is not going to be fruitful and multiply by himself. Amen, I'll say that by myself, amen. He is not going to be, I didn't have six kids by myself. That, that the role of helper here is of absolute necessity of absolute necessity, that he can't efficiently rule and subdue without Eve. And so what is her role in his complementary relationship? Whatever it takes to subdue and rule all creation. It doesn't mean just stay at home and like Uber the kids around for free for 18 years and be a soccer mom. Whatever, she, whatever it takes to subdue and rule all of creation, she's been made in God's image and likeness so that she can be his efficient, sufficient, necessary help to fulfill that task. And so together, they're to rule and subdue creation. God has made them for that. They exist for that, to keep God's good creation very good. Um, and it's good. It, God said it was good, so it has to be good. Verse 31. And then 2 4 says, And this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. And so here you have this idea of the Toledot, which in some older, and I King James is, you know, genealogy or a generation, is obviously not talking about a genealogy here. And, and, and the word means more than that. It, it just simply doesn't mean the, the genealogy. It, 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 if you, it, it I'm almost idiom, idiomatically, yeah, I like the word account, the account of, it, it, it's, it's, it's looking at um, the story of what happened to uh, and so the question here in verse 4, so the, the, this is now the story of the heavens and the earth because the original readers coming out of Egypt for 400 years, and here God has called them in Exodus 19 to be a special nation, this royal nation, this kingdom of priests. He wants to use them. They're like, well, who are you, God, and who are we? And, and, and God gives them Genesis to orient them. This is who I am. And, and, and this is why I'm calling you to be this kingdom of, this, this kingdom of priests. It's because of what happened to the heavens and the earth. That God made it very good. And you wanna, what is the story of it? It doesn't stay very good very long because man miserably fails. And you read that in chapter 3. 
And we will hear the story of what happened to the heavens and the earth. God put us in charge to subdue it and rule over it. And then chapter 3 says, there was a serpent, and it was more crafty than any animal in the field. So it's placed among the animals in the field. And one thing we know from early, the early part of chapter 2 is that God put all the animals underneath their authority. God only made Adam and Eve in his image and likeness. Adam names all the animals, showing his authority over them. But now there's one who's coming and talking. And can I tell you, the same author who gives us Genesis gives us numbers. They count a Balaam's talking donkey. Animals aren't made in God's image and likeness. They don't have the rational, intellectual uh, capacity to do that. They speak when spoken through. So here you have this animal, but there's some spiritual being speaking through the animal. And what he says is evil. He says, says, indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Did God go there, Eve? All these trees around you? Is he just on that kind of a power kick? This is because he can. He just says you can't eat from any of these trees. He made all these trees around you. Girl, think about all that. And she does start thinking. And she's thinking. And she hears. And he's deceiving, and he's moving her, and she's moving. And then he finally, to give a motive for his lie, of why God would do it, he says, God lied in verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. And God said as emphatically as you could, to die you will die. And the serpent says that you won't die. And, but, but here she's listening, and she's enticed. It says in verse 3, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes that, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took it. The one thing that God said wasn't good, she now has gone to the tree, is going to judge God? Is God right? So the finite is going to judge the infinite? The morally perfect God is now being judged by his creation? And she, she chooses the tree because she, she desired it. It says that it was good to her to make her wise. Wise for what? The end of verse 5 said that she would be like God, knowing good and evil. They were already made in God's image and likeness. Uh, So so, so they were already made like God. So like God in what capacity is a serpent saying? Be like God to be autonomous, to be independent, to be your self-ruler, not to be told by someone else what's right and wrong and what to do. Be like God, be independent so Eve, you can determine for yourself. You can be free. You, 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 You don't have to be under anyone's authority. Just decide for yourself what's right and wrong. Be your own little God. And then Adam eats and all hell breaks loose. This is a revolt. When you think of fall, it's not like they stepped on a banana and slipped. This is a revolt. This is treason of, treason of the highest order. This is what sin is. I will not have you rule over me. You made me. The next breath I'm going to breathe is I'm dependent upon you for it, but I'm going to take that breath and live how I want to live. I'm going to do what I want to do. Whatever I call good, that's what I'm going to do. So if I want to just sit and look at TV all day long and soap operas and every reality show, God, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. So evil isn't simply defined by like how I think culturally something's worse, that I'm not a murderer or something that, that bad. Evil is defined by are you rebelling against God? That God made you to be dependent upon him for a purpose of keeping his creation good and glorifying him. And then we go out and just do whatever we want to do. And so here we're in full rebellion against God. And the second that they ate, they started hiding. So death did come. It came fully, but it's coming progressively. They were instantaneously separated from God. They died. They, they were in a process now of physically dying. And unless something radically happens, they will be eternally separated from God. And so that's our state. So you have these, you begin, this is the beginning of the story and started off real good and got real bad real fast. Um, but there's hope. And it says in Genesis 3.15, as God is judging all the participants in the fall, it says that I will put enmity, God is judging the serpent, and he's talking to a rational being, not the animal. In Deuteronomy law, like if you have an animal that kills someone, you judge the animal and the owner is going to get judged. Here, God is speaking to the rational, intellectual, spiritual being. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the hill. So here in this verse you have, this is a programmatic verse, I would say. It gives you an outline of of history that that you're going to have, as it were, those whom like the 
whoever this spirit is, how it used the serpent, he'll be able to use others, and they're called as seed. He'll, there'll be some that he will use, and then God has purposes in the creation, and he will have those he will use. So we have the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, and they will be in conflict. Can I say it this way? Enmity. Let me say it a better way. There will be spiritual war, and we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. That starts right here that you have this angelic conflict on planet Earth, the spiritual warfare behind all these things that we're seeing, and Satan now is, is raising up an army to fight against those whom God will use, and this conflict is going to go on and on and on until this masculine singular pronoun, he shall bruise you on the head. And I, and I think it is a constrictive clause. That out of all of her descendants, at some point God is going to raise up one, and he's going to be a male, and he is going to be bruised on the hill. And you ask the question, what happens when you're bruised on the hill by a serpent? What happens? Well, I don't know. It depends on what kind of serpent. Well, what's going to happen here? I, 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 I can't tell here. You just have to keep reading the rest of the story. And what happens when he's bruised on the hill? You have to read. But he will be bruised on the hill. God says that. But it also says he's going to bruise the serpent's head. And that is a death blow. He may die in the, in the process, this one who's going to come and bring an end to this evil rebellion. Because what happened here, that Adam doesn't subdue, therefore he doesn't rule. Adam is subdued, and now there's an illegitimate ruler now on that throne. Jesus even says that Satan is the god of this world. The New Testament makes that clear in Ephesians chapter 2, calling him like the prince of the power of the air. Or 1 John chapter 5 ends by talk, calling him the, that he's, he's the power, he's the one who has the power over the world. So Satan has this he's an illegitimate rule, and he brings darkness, he brings evil, and God has helped man fully responsible. That God is sovereign, and man is fully responsible now that intruders like death will follow in after sin. Death and evil and sin are in our creation. So I have to talk to a mom about her son dying at 40 years old. I have to co console a grieving family because their son was shot on the freeway. Because there's evil everywhere. And we uniquely know why. We know why there's a divide. We know why there are fights. We, we understand because we know the story. And it begins right here. Because sin is spread to every single person. We all are born separated from God with an internal awareness of evil. And without God, we're slaves to the evil that's now in our hearts. And what hope do we have? We have the hope of Genesis 3.15. That here in the beginning of the Bible, you have the key characters all there. You have God, you have man, you have the serpent, and you have the coming man. They're all there. And, and, and to know what, what, you know, how is the storyline going to move? Well, the, the conflict of the story allows you to follow the, the storyline. And the conflict of the story is what did God call very good? He, he called very good that man and woman would rule over his creation. And what happens here, the serpent attacks and subdues the man, and we're not ruling. There's an Ill illegitimate ruler over God's creation. And I'll promise you this, God will not end history <laughs> with an illegitimate evil ruler over the throne that he wanted to reign that he called good. God is going to bring a reverse of fortunes, just like the serpent came into God's garden and made it a wilderness. God is going to send another man into this wilderness and make it a garden again. And the rest of the Bible directs me to, to find out who he is. But this is a promise of Christmas. Yeah, Christmas is coming. Christmas is coming. Christmas is coming. The man is going to come. I'm going to crush the serpent. Christmas is coming. They thought it was Cain in chapter 4. It wasn't Cain. Christmas is coming. You keep reading the Bible. Maybe you thought it was Noah, but it wasn't Noah. You have to keep reading the Bible, and it has a seed trail. There are pictures. There are types. There's foreshadowing. There's prophecies. And it ends in the Old Testament. This climatic promise in Isaiah 9:6 that a son is going to be given, and he's going to rule over all of the nations. He has a wonderful name, mighty counselor. He's a father of eternity. He is going to come, and he's coming. His name is Jesus. Tell the story. Tell the story. We broke creation. God sends his son to fix it. And the one he sent to fix it, his name is Jesus. He fixes our problems. He heals our broken souls. He gives us hope when there is no hope because he's overcome the evil one. He came and he crushed his head and he reigns and he rules and he's going to make all things new. 
Tell the story. Tell it. Tell it. The world doesn't want to hear it because our enemy uses others to keep attacking us. Stand up with courage and tell the story. It gives life. It gives hope. It brings redemption. We become overcomers by believing it. Tell the story. Tell the story that God was sending another king, and his name is Jesus. And he's crushed the serpent's head. And he's going to make all things new. I invite you to bow with me as we pray. Father, I just thank you for this, this school and training um, an army, Lord, to be able to use the sword. It is a spiritual battle, and we need spiritual weapons. And I just pray, Father, that you would help us to, to trust and to know that, that by faith that we overcome the world. We don't have to shrink back. Our enemy is powerful, and what he's doing is devastating. But, Lord, we can have hope in you because, Lord, of what you've given us in Christ. Help us be faithful soldiers for the King. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. God bless you.